Hello, I'm Dan Aykroyd. It's an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to be able to introduce to you this film, Evidence, the case for NASA UFOs. As the goal of the UFO movement since Roswell in 1947 has been to expose the government's knowledge of the UFO phenomena and the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence, this may be the most compelling, shocking, and powerful case presented at the dawn of the age of the new millennium. To expose the hidden secrecy behind UFOs and the government's knowledge of them. This postulation now is not based on the anecdotes, film, video, and data previously assembled, but rather on the United States government's own NASA footage photographed by the astronauts themselves on numerous space shuttle missions. Broadcast live to Earth during the 1990s, it is also based on deep investigational written correspondence between the author of this film and some of NASA's research scientists. After seeing this film, you will undoubtedly conclude, as I did, that the volume and quality of the evidence is irrefutable and undeniable. Further, this evidence prepares us for perhaps the most vital revelation, which will be revealed to us in the new millennium. And that is that we are far from alone in this multiverse we inhabit, and that there is at least one species of extra-dimensional or extraterrestrial entity that is interested in our own well-being and survival in a most profound and positive and life-affirming way. Finally, it provides empirical ancient archaeological evidence that there is someone out there, a species, a race of beings who are very interested in our progress on Earth and perhaps in a benevolent and life-affirming way. You will see that in this film the evidence is compelling, it's genuine, it's authentic, and it gives us hope. Thank you. Here, now, evidence, the case for NASA UFOs. A deep, six-year scientific investigation into unidentified flying object phenomena broadcast live by NASA throughout the 1990s space shuttle missions. According to NASA's Space Act, signed on July 29, 1958, Section 102, Paragraph C, Subparagraph A, we read, Information obtained or developed by the administrator in the performance of his functions under this Act shall be available for public inspection, except information authorized or required by federal statute to be withheld and information classified to protect the national security. Would NASA consider contact with an extraterrestrial civilization? a threat to national security? And if they did, would they classify it to protect the national security? That's what this investigation is about. We're probing deep inside of NASA, looking for answers into what may be UFOs appearing during space shuttle missions and trying to find out an answer because we know that they wouldn't come out and tell us. They would classify it to protect the national security.
Welcome to Evidence, the case for NASA's UFOs. Hi, my name is David Sarita. Throughout the 1990s, a program manager of a cable TV station named Martin Stubbs recorded over 400 hours of live NASA broadcasts. During these broadcasts, there were many scenes of what appeared to be UFOs. In about 1997, a photographer friend of mine named Mike Boyle, who knew Martin Stubbs and knew about the footage, approached me and asked me to conduct an investigation into the scientific community. What you're about to see may be the most powerful case yet to prove that we have actually made contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. Recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you. For there is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. Jesus, the Gospel of Thomas. In 1989, I got into a long conversation about nuclear fusion with NASA's Head of Propulsion, Power, and Energy, Dr. Earl Van Landingham. At the end of the conversation, I decided to take a risk and ask him, has NASA ever made contact with an, an extraterrestrial civilization? Had they ever seen any UFOs on their space shuttle missions? He answered no, and he said, when you consider the distances between our solar system and our nearest stars, Alpha Centauri A and B, 4.3 light years from Earth, Sirius is 8.7 light years from Earth. That means that when a spacecraft is doing the speed of light, it takes 8.7 years in constant space travel, not stopping for donuts and coffee, not stopping to use the bathroom, just constant space travel to get to Earth in 8.7 years. Alpha Centauri would take 4.3 uh, years to get here. That's an incredibly long period of time and a very deep commitment to going from one point in space to the other. And to acquire velocities that great, we need a tremendous amount of energy in the form of propulsion and to create the velocity that a spacecraft needs to get from that point to the other. When Earl Van Lanningham took this into consideration, he said the energy signal, the actual energy coming off of the spacecraft would be so powerful such an enormous amount of energy required for a spacecraft to do anywhere near light speed would be so huge we would detect the signal well in advance of the arrival of the spacecraft. When we consider the speed of light, which is 186,282 miles per second, which comes to about 670 million miles per hour, And when we compare that to some of the propulsion systems we're using today, for example, the Apollo missions to the moon averaged just a little over 3,000 miles per hour. The space shuttle today maintains a speed of about 18,000 miles an hour as it orbits around the 25,000 mile circumference of the Earth every 90 minutes. And our fastest satellites today can do maybe 35,000 miles an hour. So when you compare tops 35,000 miles an hour to 670 million miles per hour, you can see that we're nowhere near the speed of light and that's why we're very confined in our, in our space travel at the current time. So considering that an extraterrestrial civilization would have to be far more advanced than ours, they would have to have the energy, the tremendous amount of energy coming in the form of propulsion and giving their spacecraft velocity to get here. We should detect a signal of tremendous and tremendous powerful energy. Where would we detect such a signal and how would we detect it? So far, cameras and telescopes and other means of, of making detections such as radar are limited to the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, light, in the form of photons or, or waves, bounce off of solid objects. If this was an apple or an orange, you would see photons doing the speed of light, bouncing off of that so that we can observe uh, phenomena happening right in front of our eyes. So we observe everything uh, in, in regards to the speed of light. Um, if we were going to actually see a spacecraft that could come here uh, from such great distances and be able to even go way beyond the speed of light, we should be looking at something so powerful, something that we had never seen before. And I suspect where we should look is in the upper part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for the next part, we're going to actually look at what the electromagnetic spectrum is and what light is so we can see where the best place to actually detect a signal from a spacecraft would be. 
So what is light? Light, in effect, is actually just energy vibrating in different energy spectrums. Um, I've made a chart here of the electromagnetic spectrum, what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. And we can see, basically, from the diagram, that light is just energy in the form of waves. And these waves, as we go higher into this energy spectrum, start to oscillate faster and faster and faster per second. It was Heinrich Hertz who identified electromagnetic waves as Hertzian waves. Um, every single second you could produce one oscillating wave, you would have one hertz. And the higher you would go into this spectrum, you would get more and more and more oscillations per second in this wave. In fact, this actual chart here is not very accurate because when you get, even when you get into the uh, radio and television um, spectrum, Hertzian waves are oscillating in the, up to the millions of times per second. But um, anyway, Max Planck, the godfather of quantum physics, was the first physicist to come up with an energy formula in regards to the electromagnetic spectrum. He said energy was equal to the frequency with which these waves are quantum of light oscillated. So the, the, the more oscillations per second that occurred in a wave, the greater the energy was present. Einstein won the Nobel Prize in 1921 for explaining the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is essentially the conversion of photons the mass particles that are basically light, and converting them into electrons, which is energy. He discovered that when photons struck a metal plate or a conductor, the metal plate ejected an electron. So when the, the photons, which are light particles, came into the object, the, the uh, conductor ejected an electron, and that electron had a charge on it. So what that showed is that photons, light, had energy in them, and that light could be converted into usable electricity. Well, and when we consider again the equation of energy in relation to space travel, and that we needed this huge amount of energy in order for a spacecraft to do the speed of light, um, many problems arise. Einstein said in his formula E equals mc squared that as a spacecraft or any mass object tried to approach the speed of light, the impeding forces of inertia became so great on that mass that the amount of energy required had to increase proportional to how fast you were going. Eventually, um, Stephen, Hawking, St Stephen Hawking's wrote of Einstein's equation that the problem with attaining the speed of light for any spacecraft would be that as that spacecraft tried to reach light speed, its mass would increase so much that an infinite amount of energy would be required for the spacecraft to attain the speed of light, and therefore it could never actually attain the speed of light. So, energy is the big problem. We need tremendous amount of energy for a spacecraft to do the speed of light, and if we were going to detect a spacecraft that had the kind of energy required to go the speed of light, it should be detectable somewhere, we would hope, in the electromagnetic spectrum. Today, most of our cameras look in the visible light spectrum right here. This is all we see with our human brains. So this is what we know of light today. There are radio and TV photons. There are microwave photons. There are infrared photons detectable usually as heat. Um, some snakes and reptiles can actually see in the infrared, but our eyes can't see that low in frequency. Then there's the color red. Um, red is actually a frequency of energy. It's actually a frequency of energy wave and the color orange, and going all the way up into green, into blue, into violet. Violet is the most energetic color that our brains can see, and most of our cameras can see. Above violet is ultraviolet, and ultraviolet light is divided into near, far, and extreme. So the ultraviolet bandwidth, as we know it, actually extends a little further than my, my diagram shows here, but basically goes five or six times the bandwidth that the human eye can see. So again, if we can observe and take pictures into these higher spectrum, what we are actually seeing in that spectrum is more energy, actual energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. When we take a picture in the X-ray spectrum, we're actually seeing energy. And by the time we get up into gamma rays, we're seeing a tremendous amount of energy in the form of an observation. So again, if a UFO were coming here from another planet, from another star system, and we were expecting it to have a tremendous amount of energy to allow that spacecraft to conquer the vast distances of space in very little time, we should be detecting something that should be way up into at least the visible light spectrum and even higher. 
So far, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence in Mountain View, California, uses a vast array of radio telescopes to try to look for intelligent signals in the form of radio signals or TV signals coming from another planet or another star. And if we receive such a signal, such as in the movie uh, Contact, um, you, you would expect to see an intelligent signal in, in the form of a radio or TV wave. But so far, that effort has retrieved nothing. I believe the reason they haven't found anything down here is because there's not enough energy down here. They forgot the energy part of the equation, that it takes energy to get velocity in, in, in the form of propulsion to get here. And even an intelligent signal coming from another planet would require tremendous amounts of energy. So I believe we should be looking at least here in the visible light spectrum, and we have. There have been many alleged reported sightings of UFOs in this spectrum because we, that's what we see. But in my philosophy, when I consider Einstein's law equals mc squared, that mass cannot attain the speed of light um, because of the forces of resistance and inertia, I would expect a spacecraft to be pure energy, something that is that is not even physical as we know it. Something that would be matter vibrating in a very high frequency state. And basically we should be looking for a craft that looks like an energy ball or an energy wave. And that, that energy wave should be a very, very energetic wave that should only be detectable in these upper spectrum. So what I started to do is to see where was NASA looking. NASA knows the same thing I'm telling you. Um, space scientists know this, the same thing that I'm telling you. Where are they looking? And what I found out was the space shuttle's video cameras were looking into these upper spectrum of light. In fact, the video camera on the space shuttle can see uh, near ultraviolet photons as well as the visible light spectrum. And this is exactly where we would start to see something with a tremendous amount of energy. Say this was the UFO here, um, and it wasn't visible down here. That would tell me if we were detecting something here just to start with, um, that that object would be a very, very high energy object. It would be a, a quantumized, uh, phenomenal uh, aircraft or spacecraft. And there would be nothing physical about it. It would be pure energy. In fact, we should be looking for a spacecraft that is made of pure energy. And um, what you're about to see in this investigation is black and white video footage taken from the space shuttle throughout the 1990s and a camera that is capable of seeing into at least the near UV spectrum. So if some of these objects that we see in the tape were not visible to people's naked eyes down in here, um, it should come as no surprise. We're looking at high energy phenomenal objects. To punish me for my contempt for authority, fate made me an authority myself. Albert Einstein. In 1996-97, I began my investigation at NASA. I decided who can I talk to at NASA to do an investigation into unexplainable phenomena. And at the top of my list were astrophysicists and astrochemists. I looked on NASA's website and found the email address for Dr. Joseph Newth III, the NASA head of astrochemistry, and started a dialogue with him that turned out to be very successful. He first told me that NASA was making observations of unexplainable objects entering the Earth's atmosphere, um, detectable only in the ultraviolet range of light, something that was very peculiar to me. The idea that an object could only be visible in the ultraviolet suggested to me a quantumized, very, very energetic object, and that was not visible in lower spectra of light was very, very curious. The scientist who headed the investigation was Dr. Louis A. Frank. And Frank basically made observations on satellites that were roughly 25,000 kilometers uh, away from the Earth, orbiting the Earth at a very, very large uh, a radius. And these satell the satellite was called Polaris. The Polaris satellite was taking pictures in the, um, in the far ultraviolet of the Earth. And he started to notice these impacting objects that he called small comets. They were about 40 feet wide, made mostly of water, and he detected they were made mostly of water. He didn't know for sure, but they were made mostly of water, and they were impacting the, the Earth at a rate of about 10 
to 20 million impacts a year. Okay, so that was where I started. Those objects apparently were fluffy, house-sized comets of very low density and looked like energy balls. They actually didn't really look like water and he wasn't sure they were made of water. So I decided to write Dr. Newth a letter at NASA and ask him about these things to see if there was any similarities to these and these alleged UFOs that were showing up on the black and white video cameras of the space shuttle. I wrote him, Dear Dr. Newth, if these little meteors are hitting the Earth's upper atmosphere and dissolving, wouldn't the intense solar radiation break the H2O into oxygen and hydrogen separated, thus releasing tremendous amounts of oxygen into the upper atmosphere? When oxygen undergoes further solar radiation, O2, oxygen, transmutates into O3, ozone. Could these space meteors be actually healing our ozone layer? Is this proof that there is a God? Please answer. I wasn't actually kidding about the ozone question because Water basically is made of hydrogen and oxygen. And when water is exposed to the intense radiation from our sun, x-rays and gamma rays with temperatures that are off the chart as far as humans could possibly bear, and even ultraviolet light we know is much hotter than, than visible light. Uh, we know that because we get skin cancer when we allow ultraviolet light to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere and it can actually cause very serious damage to our skin. The first question about these objects being water to me was how could water transit from one point in space to Earth and actually survive this intense radiation? In theory, in space theory, space is minus 273 degrees centigrade. It's freezing in space. But as soon as any object, any gas, liquid or object appears in space, it basically gets bombarded by tremendous radiation from the sun and tremendous radiation from the stars in the form of X-rays and gamma rays and ultraviolet light and so on. And the temperatures, the nuclear reactions that go on in the water would be so intense the water would burn up in a matter of seconds. These are allegedly 40 ton balls of water doing 35,000 miles an hour, but how did they get here? How did they come from the vast distances of space and get here and remain as they are? It has been known for a very long time that the Earth is under constant bombardment by extraterrestrial material, 20 kilotons per year, most of which is micron-sized dust shed by comets and asteroids, as well as some finite number of larger meteors. The house-sized comet proposal is in addition to this known flux, and is unique in that these bodies are supposed to consist mostly or almost exclusively of water. Because no satisfactory mechanism has been proposed to explain their survival in the interplanetary medium or their non-detection by a variety of other means, example, IRS, COBE, and IEU, most scientists do not believe that such bodies actually exist. The general belief is that the observations are valid, but the interpretations are wrong. If the interpretation is correct, however, the rate of deposition into the Earth's atmosphere of oxygen or water is only a minute fraction of the amount that is already there, except in the uppermost layers. For this reason, additional oxygen would be much too small to measure. If large masses of meteoric material relative to the mass of the Earth's atmosphere to impact the Earth, the effects would be disastrous, even if the impactors were only made of water. So he's saying that these small amounts of water that are entering the Earth's atmosphere don't have the potential, in his opinion, as the head of astrochemistry at NASA to produce a significant amount of ozone to hear our ozone layer. But he does understand the fundamental problem. Most scientists don't believe these detections, the detection of these objects are real because none of them show up on infrared satellites. Infrared is heat. And again, if intense radiation were hitting these balls of water and they started to heat up, you should get a very, very high heat signal that should be detectable on infrared, but no signal appeared. So the mystery gets very, very deep about what these objects may be. Dear Dr. Newth, thanks for the info. So the phenomena couldn't be from the comet. However, how could any object made mostly of water in liquid form survive in space over any great distances unless it had some kind of phenomenal membrane to protect it? Wouldn't the H2O, as you observe, absorb the intense radiation from the sun and produce heat so much that it would dissolve the H and the O? If the temperature of cold space is minus 273 degrees centigrade, and upon exposure to direct intense radiation from the sun, tremendous heat is formed. At 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, hydrogen separates from oxygen. How could such an object travel in space for even a minute, let alone travel from one point in space to another, unless? Again, 
um, I'm proposing the problem of how these objects detected by Dr. Louis A. Frank in the ultraviolet, how could they have possibly arrived at Earth? In theory, they could not. It didn't make any sense to me how they could. He immediately wrote me back, Dear Mr. Sarita, you have enumerated a few of the problems with Frank's hypothesis and probably now realize why few scientists think that the phenomena seen by Lou Frank are actually comets. No one doubts that he has observed something in capital letters, just not comets. In spite of the fact that many people are sure that Frank's explanation for his observations are incorrect, there has been no good alternative explanation proposed yet. I'm sure that there will eventually be one that even Frank can agree to. So the sweater shows amazing evidence that NASA is actually detecting something in space that's moving, that's coming to our Earth, and it shouldn't be there. Something that defies all the laws of physics. If you remember what I said about the electromagnetic spectrum earlier, that we should be detecting an object in the high upper frequencies of light and not detectable in the lower, that that would be evident to suggest that we're looking at a highly quantized object, which means a highly energized object. This detection fits all of those descriptions and all those criteria. But that isn't the, this isn't the end of my investigation. But for now, this is what, we, what I found out, that NASA was observing something out there, and they didn't know what it was. It was the first time that anyone at NASA could admit that there was an unidentified and unexplained phenomena happening in our skies, and that no one had the answer. Dear Dr. Newth, thanks for the email response to my question. I'm amazed at how such a phenomena can be observed, yet the denial of its existence because it doesn't fit into the theory of the solar system. What are the chances that the H2O house size objects are tailings from the recent passing of the comet Hale-Bopp? Any ideas? Do you have any more thoughts on this? Please send email. Thanks. Dear Mr. Sarita, I would agree with your amazement in the scientific community ignoring Frank's observations if it were true. However, that is not the case. I know of no individual that does not believe that Frank saw something. The controversy centers just on what it was that yielded the signal. He believes that house-sized comets of very low density are responsible for both the recent detection of water and his previous 1985's observations using the DE spacecraft's UV cameras. Few other people agree with him. By the way, those previous observations would mean that the phenomena would be a continuous process rather than one associated with a particular comet such as Hale-Bopp. The reasons are many, but the best center on the fact that these objects should have been detected on several other satellites such as COBE, IRAS, and ISO. Those are infrared satellites. These satellites have instruments that are very sensitive to radiation in the infrared region. These fluffy, house-sized objects should be at a temperature near 300 K or even higher as they near the Earth since very fluffy objects are much better absorbers in the visible than they are emitters in the infrared. <laughs> they should therefore be infrared beacons because they are so very close. Yet no other satellite has ever seen evidence of these objects. This includes a vast array of Department of Defense satellites as far as I can learn. Because these objects are being bombarded by high energy cosmic rays, we should get a tremendous amount of heat. Dr. Newth suggests 300K, which makes, should make them infrared beacons. But NASA's infrared satellites, COBE, IRAS, and ISO, can't see these objects. Again, this tells me something. It tells me I'm looking at a very high energy quantized object that's only visible in the near and far ultraviolet light spectrum, but not visible in the lower spectrum. So I detect possibly we're looking at some sort of an extraterrestrial intelligence or possibly a UFO, but I haven't drawn that conclusion yet. In the game of process of elimination, we've eliminated space debris, we've eliminated shooting stars, and we've eliminated space junk because none of those things would be invisible in the lower spectrum of light. They would all be detectable at least in infrared and invisible and also in, in, in lower spectrum. But they're not. These things are only detectable in the UV spectrum. Newth continues, it simply means that we are still looking for a suitable explanation. Frank's hypothesis has not yielded any predictions that could be verified by observation that have been shown to be correct and has many observable consequences that are demonstrably false. Until he has a satisfactory answer for why we do not see what we should see in the infrared, most people will continue to believe that his interpretation of his own UV observations are flawed. They will, however, believe that he does observe something.
So again, NASA is admitting that they are actually detecting something, something that shouldn't be there. Other scientists deny the detection of these objects because they've never seen a high energy object before. They've never detected something that doesn't show up in infrared. And I detect the signatures written all over this that we're looking at a very high quantumized object, the very type of object that I think we should be looking for in regards to extraterrestrial intelligence. Water could essentially travel from one part of the solar system to the other and, and actually protect itself from the intense cosmic rays of the sun. But the only way water could do that is if these alleged water balls that are about 40 feet in diameter and 40 tons each had a phenomenal membrane or radiant barrier to protect it. Um, example, space shuttles wrap them, the space shuttle is wrapped in an aluminum foil that actually balances out uh, radiant rays of X-rays and gamma rays and actually protects the space shuttle from being destroyed and overly radiated by these highly charged um, forms of radiation. Um, a water ball is so vulnerable out above the Earth's atmosphere that without some kind of phenomenal membrane protecting it, it couldn't survive. But the only way I suggest that it could actually arrive from one point in space to the other assuming that Dr. Louis A. Frank is correct in his, in his interpretation that there's actually water in these balls is as if they had this phenomenal membrane around them. If you can imagine kind of a mirror-like or foil-like barrier, that barrier would shine and reflect off all of the, of, the, of the very, very harmful rays and actually protect the water. But that would make it an intelligent thing. That would also make it a living thing. Cezent Giorgi, the Nobel Prize winning biochemist and discoverer of vitamin C, has called water the matrix of life, without it, life cannot take hold, nor could the evolution of life begin. Basically, all living things, including humans, are made mostly of water, but we have actual barriers. In the case of humans, we have skin, and, and that skin has pigment in it that protects us from harmful ultraviolet rays of light that are filtered out. Um, plants are made mostly of water. Animals um, have thick skin, but they're made mostly of water. So, I'm not suggesting that some naked um, uh, alien uh, entity is actually flying through space and entering our Earth's atmosphere, but I'm suggesting that if water is surviving deep transits in space in such a small quantity, that it, the only way it could do it is if it had some kind of phenomenal membrane pr to protect it. But I can't prove that in this case yet because no one has actually captured one of Lou Frank's mysterious uh, small comets or water balls or whatever we want to call them. At this point, most scientists agree that he observed something, but we just don't know what that is yet. There was one more peculiar thing about Dr. Neuss's last letter to me. It reads, Yet no other satellite has ever seen evidence of these objects. This includes a vast array of Department of Defense satellites, as well and as far as I can learn. If the Department of Defense was looking for these objects, we must assume that they were also mystified, that someone at NASA was mystified about these objects. Because if they were water balls, why would the Department of Defense go looking for them? And if, as some scientists hypothesize, that there was nothing there and that Lou Frank made an incorrect interpretation of a signal, then why, again, would the Department of Defense use a vast array of satellites to look for these objects? We must assume that someone up at NASA, very, very high up, ordered the, the, the search and the, uh, the effort to actually try to detect these objects on a vast array of more sophisticated satellites. And that would mean that they don't really believe that these things are just some sort of passing and, and unimportant phenomena. Other environmentally interesting targets uh, of opportunity during the uh, day passes. Typically, when the orbiter is uh, on the dark side of the Earth, as it, as it is now, at least for the next uh, five to six minutes, the low-light level uh, black and white cameras uh, are much better at uh, observing the Earth surface and the star clusters as the orbiter passes uh, high overhead. When the orbiter moves within uh, a daylight pass, the color cameras in the payload bay are used to uh, get uh, more interesting sights uh, on the day side of the Earth.
The first object that we're looking at on this videotape, we have one of three incredible phenomena happening at the same time, so we're going to kind of break it down and start with each phenomena and kind of go into them a little bit. So the first thing we see is a bright fireball leaving the zero plane of Earth, Earth is over here, um, at about 35 degrees away from the zero point and going straight up out into space up here. The object is moving across the screen. And we have to assume what is this object. For one, we're looking at the Space Shuttle's black and white low-level cameras that can see into the near ultraviolet spectrum, so we may be seeing it a quantumized object. But also, it's leaving Earth's gravity, and that's something that is impossible unless the object has internal energy in it, energy that's powerful enough for the object to actually escape gravity. So this object is definitely escaping the Earth's gravity, and, and, and that is simply cannot be a natural object. Any meteor, shooting star, or piece of space dust is going to get pulled into the powerful gravity of the Earth and burn up as it hits the Earth's atmosphere and, and disappear in a matter of a few kilometers, assuming it's a very small object. This object doesn't do that. It escapes Earth's gravity, so we have to assume that it has internal energy in it, and that leads us to the possibility that we're looking at a UFO. The second object we're looking at in this scene is called the high-speed turn. If you look up in this portion of the video monitor, you're going to see an object come in, make a high-speed turn, heading out into space, a very, not quite a 90-degree turn, and then it will be followed and pursued by another, another actual object going this way. So again, when we consider the physics of a solid object traveling at, at, at least a couple of thousand miles an hour, making a high-speed turn, and probably in the neighborhood of 20 to 30,000 miles an hour, the physics of a turn like that is actually impossible. For any physical object going that speed to make a sudden turn, the g-forces on the turn alone would destroy physically, actually, your entire physical body if you were inside of a spacecraft as we know it, would just smash like a pancake. You'd be, you'd be uh, spam in a can. You'd be dead. In fact, even a meteorite a solid object making a turn like that, the explosion on the turn, the g-forces in the collapsing of matter would cause a nuclear uh, fusion explosion. It would cause a massive explosion. And if this high-speed turn was caused by uh, an impact, a collision with another object, and then deflected off of the object and made a turn, you should see a massive explosion at the point of the turn, and we don't actually see that. The only way that I hypothesize that any object could make a high-speed turn like this is if the object was a highly quantized energy phenomena, that if matter, mass, was actually transformed into high-frequency waveform energy and had no, no actual weight to it, in fact, it, was, it became lighter than the lightest elements we know on the Earth, only then could an object make a turn like that and survive, and physically and structurally survive. And again, the very fact that this can do this suggests to me the kind of physics that these craft are using. They have taken raw, solid mass, a solid spacecraft or solid material, changed the frequency into a high energy waveform, and in that waveform, they're able to not only conquer light speed and, and possibly do light speed and conquer light speed, but they're able to make turns like this and maneuver uh, in ways that, that are just impossible, that would cause a nervous breakdown to any modern physicist. No physicist can look at this object and, and admit that we're looking at anything other than possibly dust in front of the camera lens or some sort of debris because they know that for any massive object to be doing velocities greater than even, even at 100 miles an hour, which this object is obviously going much faster than, imagine going 100 miles an hour on a freeway and all of a sudden you just turn on a dime and go in a different direction what would happen to your body inside of the automobile? You would go flying through the windshield at 100 miles an hour and, and you'd be dead. So what kind of physics are these craft using? What, what are we actually seeing here? Is this space dust? Is this debris? Is this a shooting star? Is this a meteorite? The answer is no, because we know that no physical object could structurally survive a turn like that. What you're about to see is the hypervelocity object sequence. It's actually one of my favorites in the investigation because it has some very powerful conclusions. So if you look in your video monitor, over here to the lower right, you're going to look for a little fuzzy object. It's very fuzzy. There's a lot of static on the screen. 
And you're going to see it moving at incredible speeds in a very curved fashion, very curved fashion, going into the atmosphere and disappearing at the point of the horizon right here. It's absolutely conclusive. If this object disappears on the horizon, that this is not a piece of dust in the, in the near fields of the camera lens, 20 or 30 miles away or even 10 feet away. The object moves in a very curved fashion, it's, suggesting it's moving over the curvature of the Earth and very curved and disappearing on the horizon and probably going around to the other side of the planet. The fact that it's going around the planet and disappearing on the horizon is absolutely conclusive. And this is a very important piece of footage because nowhere else do we have a scene where we have such powerful relativity. Because we know the object is going from here to here, if we could assume the distance, if we could actually find the distance that the object moved, we could calculate its speed. Assuming the Earth is approximately 25,000 miles in circumference and that using some modest calculations as to the curvature of the Earth here, I estimate that the distance between here to here is roughly 1 24th, 1 25th of the Earth's circumference. So that would make the distance between here and here roughly 1,000 miles. If the object traveled between here and here, I count in approximately four seconds. We can assume that the object is going approximately 250 miles per second. That is an incredible speed. It actually comes to 900,000 miles per hour. 900,000 miles per hour is faster than any known object to, to, to man and to, and to space flight. Assuming the space shuttle is traveling at approximately 18,000 miles in the opposite direction, 18,000 miles an hour, I would have to subtract that speed and we would come to 882,000 miles per hour for the object. So it's roughly going between 900,000 and 882,000 miles per hour. Incredible speed. We've never seen anything going this fast. Remember, the Apollo missions to the moon average 3,300 miles per hour. The space shuttle is going at 18,000 miles per hour. And meteorites and uh, shooting stars top at around 45,000 miles an hour. So we know from the object speed that we're looking at that there's no way this is a shooting star or, or a meteorite. It's far, too, it's far too fast to be an object like that. And also, our fastest satellites using ion propulsion drive systems are going roughly tops at maybe 35,000 miles an hour. So comparatively, if all of this is correct and the object is actually traveling at 900,000 miles an hour, we're looking at speeds that are beyond anything known to science at this point in time. So before we actually decide if this is actually a UFO, we will have to do some, some estimates and some studies into advanced propulsion systems being conducted at some of our universities and some of our space labs to see if anyone could come up with speeds anywhere near this. We know that current technology, again, NASA's it, today is actually using thruster engines in the space shuttle and the Apollo missions to the moon were also using thruster engines that fire out tremendous amounts of hydrogen and other gases at tremendous speeds and with all of that thrust capacity we're getting speeds between you know may, maybe topping, topping at around 20,000 miles an hour. But actually we're getting beyond that now. We're starting to go into what are called ion propulsion systems. Remember in 1989 after I had a long conversation with Dr. Earl Van Landingham, then head of propulsion power and energy division at NASA, we were talking about nuclear fusion, a particular type of nuclear fusion called deuterium-helium-3 fusion. Deuterium-helium-3 fusion was being developed by a scientist named Dr. Bogdan Castle maglich an MIT PhD who had spent about $27 million in research onto a new type of non-radioactive fusion. NASA at the time was very interested in this, Dr. Van Der Lang told me, because NASA was looking for a space power source. 
They needed a type of energy to drive its future ion propulsion systems. At the present day, the best power sources they could get were around only 100 kilowatts, 100,000 watts. So looking at deuterium helium-3 fusion, um, Dr. Van Nuttingham told me, produces an energy of 18 million electron volts per fusion, an energy level that is far beyond any of our current um, space power sources. He also said that he was very interested in this particular type of fusion because he realized that 18 MeV protons, um, 18 MeV energies applied to protons could power spacecraft at velocities beyond our, our current imaginations. He said at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, they were doing studies into what are called anti-proton anti propulsion systems. He said that 18 MeV protons could send spacecraft up to one-tenth the speed of light. One-tenth the speed of light comes to 67 million miles per hour. 67 million miles per hour. So if we could imagine that somebody has actually developed a technology that powerful, we can see when we do a comparative analysis that our object that is moving between 900,000 and 882,000 miles per hour fits well within the constraints of a nuclear propulsion system. But we know for certain that Dr. Bogdan Castle Maglish's helium-3 fusion did not get proper funding. The project didn't get completed. At the time, James Fletcher, who was then the chief administrator of NASA, went to the United States Congress and asked for funding to complete this fusion because, again, it would be the most powerful form of energy for, for space stations and for space propulsion systems that NASA had ever developed. He was turned down. The project didn't get completion funding and to this day remains you know, in a scientist's mind and it hasn't gone any further than that. So where else on the Earth could we find evidence of nuclear propulsion systems being developed? We've all heard of the Area 51, the mysterious basin in Nevada where people see phenomenal black ops and secret projects and objects that may be UFOs flying in the skies being test flown by secret Air Force Base uh, scientists. Well, I did some research into the top four defense contractors in the United States. You have Boeing, you have SAIC, you have Lockheed Martin, and you have EG&G. EG&G boasts that in 1968, at the NTS rocket station in Nevada, that's the nuclear test site rocket station in Nevada, Phobos 2A, the most powerful nuclear reactor and nuclear propulsion system is successfully tested. The most powerful nuclear propulsion system ever tested, successful in 1968. So if that was successful in 1968, we can only imagine where that research is today. But NASA doesn't use nuclear propulsion systems, so who is using these technologies and where? So if, it could be possible, it could be possible that there is a secret alternative space program utilizing these technologies and that the object we just saw is actually a test flight that the space shuttle crew knew was going on and actually videotaped it as a test to see the capabilities of this craft. That's a possibility, but we can't actually arrive there yet because we have one more problem. I'll demonstrate what that is. The space shuttle flies at an altitude of about 300 miles above the Earth. This is the space shuttle here, and this is the top of the atmosphere here. The top of the atmosphere is at about 100 miles, according to Dr. Newth at NASA. So we can assume there's a distance between the top of the Earth's atmosphere and the space shuttle of 200 miles. Okay, so that means if the object, as we have concluded, was moving over the curvature of the Earth and disappeared in the atmosphere and went around the other side, and we didn't see the object go way up here and loop out and go around the other side, that would mean it went above the top of the atmosphere. It disappeared right in here, which means it must have went around the other side of the Earth. So we know the object is down in the 100-mile range. If the object is down in the 100-mile range, and the space shuttle is at 300 miles above it, then the distance between the object and the, and the space shuttle must be at least 200 miles. The very fact that you can even see an object from 200 miles is incredible. 
Have you ever looked up at a 747 flying in the sky above you at 35,000 feet? You can see the vapor trail very clearly, but the 747 is just a tiny dot in the sky. 35,000 feet is roughly between 6 and 7 miles away. In this case, we're looking at an object 200 miles away. Again, I state it's amazing that you can even see an object that far away. So if we're looking at an object 200 away and it's even visible from 200 miles away, my estimates suggest that the object must be massive in size, far bigger than a 747. I guess approximately around a half a kilometer to a half a mile wide. If the object is a, is a half a kilometer to a half a mile wide, it must be something beyond anything we're developing here on the Earth because there's no way we can imagine that our space programs are developing spaceships that's that large, spaceships that large, that are capable of going 900,000, 800,000 miles. And another problem exists in, in, in this, the idea that this may be a, a human-made or a man-made spacecraft. If the object is going at nearly a million miles an hour and moving in this curved fashion over the Earth, as soon as you start accelerating a spacecraft or, or, or an aircraft and it starts making turns, you get g-forces. At these speeds, I don't believe any pilot could possibly survive the turns and the g-forces at, at 900,000 miles an hour. I think it would be impossible on the human body. Again, suggesting that this is a highly energized quantum object that's vibrating at a very high frequency which means its mass has been converted into a very high frequency wave state which can allow it to make these incredibly high speed turns and even radical turns like the object we saw earlier and, and basically implicating the possibility of what we're looking at is actually a UFO. The next scene you're about to look at is called the Hubble Repair Mission Sequence. It shows two astronauts repairing the Space Hubble Telescope. What's peculiar about it is there's an object going behind them. It has a kind of a light flashing to it. And it goes behind the astronauts and we actually hear them talking about it. So listen closely to what they actually say. Looks like you got an object right in front of you, Mark. Can you look out there? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Never mind. So what were the astronauts actually saying? We heard, it looks like you got an object right out there in front of you, Mark. Are you looking out there? It's about your 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock going away. Don't worry about it. We know the astronaut on the left is probably the one we're talking about. That's probably Mark because at his 11 o'clock position is where we actually see the UFO or we see the unidentified object. It has a light flashing to it. It's definitely going behind them. So we, we can assume immediately that obviously these astronauts are not talking about space debris or space junk going by because it's obviously something of significance. It captures their attention for a moment and they're told to ignore it and to focus on the repair of the mission. So we could assume maybe they've been seeing these things frequently out there. Maybe this is an ordinary occurrence um, and it's not something they should become so alarmed about. Later we hear, uh, we think the camera filter came off Mark. We know camera filters are screwed tightly onto cameras and there's no way they would unscrew in space and go floating out there. So obviously, again, this is one of NASA's blatant lies trying to tell the public during a live broadcast that what we're seeing is something that they can explain. The next scene you're about to see is called the Russian Space Station Mirror Sequence. The first part of this scene actually just shows two little, what appear to be shooting stars and what we're told are shooting stars streaking through the hue of the Earth's atmosphere. The problem is they just keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going. They never burn up. So what's wrong with this scene? They appear to be just meteors, and I shouldn't really be, be even be arguing the point, but I am, for one very specific reason. Meteorites, when they strike the Earth's atmosphere, they're usually very small pieces of, of rock, maybe this big around, some this big around, and some, some larger ones. But most meteorites are small enough that they burn up within a few kilometers. After they come in into the Earth's atmosphere, they start to flare and burn up. 
and the, the, the resistance on the Earth's atmosphere and their velocity produces so much heat that they're basically gone in a matter of a split second. If you've ever seen a shooting star streaking across the sky, it literally just streaks, you see it, and then it's gone. That's because it burnt up and it's finished. So the only way a meteorite could go for the large distances that these objects go through and continue to streak on would be as if they were massive in size. In 1908 in Siberia, an event called the Tunguska event, um, a massive 70 meter wide meteorite, only 70 meters wide, struck the forest in northern Russia and led to an explosion that was equal to several nuclear blasts, several uh, Hiroshima's, leveled uh, miles and miles and miles of force with a massive impact. So we know, again, the only way an object could travel and survive the vast distances would be as if it's a massive meteorite, a massive object. And we know from history that during the 1990s we never had a massive meteoric impact on the Earth. So what were these objects doing streaking over such vast distances if they were indeed meteorites? It's, it's curious. I'm, I'm not going to arrive at UFO with these little objects, but it's a very, very curious scene. So the next part of the Russian space station mirror sequence I find really funny. This, this scene to me is, is humorous because what is actually happening, we have the day glow of the Earth here, the Earth's atmosphere here, the Earth is down here, and we see all these white dots, which we assume are stars, and the commentary is that the astronauts are actually looking for the Russian space station mirror. Mirror is a very big space station, and it's something you sh should be able to detect out there with your eyes and with cameras with zoom lenses on them. But the problem is, while they're looking for the mirror, there's a lot of other objects that are moving very slowly. You'll see big blobs of light that are moving really slowly in many different points across the screen. Now, if we're looking at stars, all of the stars with the movement of the space shuttle are going to be moving in a consistent line together in unison because they're not moving points of light. But distinguishable from the stars are other blobs of light moving around. And we also see a bunch of things that we're told are shooting stars coming in at right angles to the camera, coming into the Earth's atmosphere. And we see these things going in all sorts of different directions. Uh, we actually even see one then leaving the Earth's atmosphere going out in this direction, which is something, again, impossible for a meteorite or a shooting star or even space debris to do because it, anything leaving Earth's atmosphere requires internal energy, and internal energy requires and, assume, and, and suggests intelligence. So again, what's very disturbing, what's funny about it is, is they can't actually find the mirror because there's so many other things actually moving around out there. This is Mission Control Houston. We are using the payload bay cameras right now to hopefully catch a glimpse of the Russian space station mirror as it performs an on-orbit burn though it will be difficult to uh, pick Mir out from the stars as they pass behind us. The uh, payload bay cameras are positioned such that they're looking straight back, back, straight back behind the orbiter where the Mir is flying at about 850 nautical miles behind us. No joy from here, sorry. I hope it was a good one, though, for our friends. Thank you, sir. We could not see it here either. We'll wait two or three more minutes till sunrise, and then uh, at that time, give you a go for KU Stowe. We're to mission lapse time of seven days, 13 hours, and 17 minutes. This is Mission Control Houston. The uh, Mir space station is now visible on the uh, far left-hand side of the screen, about about an inch from the bottom of this particular picture. Okay, the Mir space station is the small flashing light in the center, about an inch from. Camera Charlie on a monitor. The uh, left hand the side of the screen. It's slowly. Charlie Hill on the camera. Um, it is slowly moving closer to the left hand side and is uh, very, has a very light flashing to it. We think on the middle of the screen, way to the left hand side.
We think you can see a flashing light just a little bit to the left of the center of the screen, very faint. Yeah, we do see something flashing visually, but we're not sure that that might be... Uh This is Mission Control Houston. Once again, we believe we were just able to spot the Mir spacecraft as it flies about at 850 nautical miles behind Discovery. So you just saw the footage. You saw a lot of things streaking out there. You saw the confusion of the astronauts trying to find the space station in Mir. And in the end, they never really find it. Again, if what we're looking at is number, the number one contention of NASA is everything on these videotapes is just debris floating by and we're seeing optical illusions. Do you really think an astronaut can't tell the difference between a space station mirror and a piece of debris, a piece of dust, or, or a cookie crumb floating through space? Of course they can tell the difference. So whatever the other objects are that are moving around out there obviously aren't debris. There are other objects that are obscuring their view and are confusing the astronauts. But even more peculiar to me, the theory that the streaking objects are actually meteorites. If the streaking objects were really meteors, then why do they never appear in this video to burn up and disintegrate into the atmosphere? If they were meteors, they should behave like them. And even more curious, as the shuttle is flying 200 miles above the top of the atmosphere, why are we seeing meteors at all? In theory, they should be invisible dark bodies until they strike the upper atmosphere and start to produce a meteoric burn, making them luminous and clearly visible. But many of these streaking objects are highly luminous way above the top of the atmosphere. Could they be unidentified flying objects? In 1993, I met with and had a casual conversation with the head of the Russian space program. He didn't speak English. But through an interpreter, a young Russian woman, I asked him if the Russian cosmonauts had ever seen UFOs. He laughed but answered my question. We have never seen anything like that. If the cosmonauts had seen UFOs, I would be the first one to know about it. But there has been some evidence from the Russian cosmonauts saying they had actually seen flying saucers on recent missions to the Mir. A Russian cosmonaut named Alexander Baladin stated at a UFO convention that Flying saucers have come into close proximity to the Mir space station many times. He added there is sufficient evidence to warrant a scientific study of the phenomena and that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge the UFO phenomenon's existence. Bowden disclosed December 23, 1998, during an international ufology forum in Brazil, that he and fellow cosmonaut Musa Manarov had seen UFOs. During docking operations between his space capsule and the Mir, Baladin saw a glowing object a short distance away. Could these be the same lights that are being witnessed on this NASA Russian space station Mir sequence? Musa Manarov captured the UFOs on videotape that was shown during the UFO Congress in Brazil. Baladin claimed that the recording and other evidence presented during the Congress must be studied by an international scientific commission. Why were Russian cosmonauts coming forward to tell their stories while American astronauts wouldn't breathe a word? Were the Russian cosmonauts more excited about sharing information on intelligent contact with extraterrestrials and with the world than Americans? So I waited for the answer from Joseph Newth, and considering the fact that Congress was already doing hearings into space shuttle footage, I expected a very, very negative answer, and that's what I got. The letter reads, Dear Mr. Sarita, I did look carefully at the video you sent, and I really must apologize to you for not replying sooner. The objects that were on the video 
appear to me to be floating debris from the cargo bay of the space shuttle. These objects often appear to be fuzzy because they got quite close to the camera and were often out of focus. Because they were so close, they also appear to travel at high speed, and any minor disturbance within the shuttle environment, for example outgassing, firing of attitude control thrusters, etc. is magnified enormously, thus the rapid turns. The spotty illumination and shadowing in the bay can also make objects suddenly appear or disappear. I saw a wealth of similar debris come up off the floor and out of many minor crevices during microgravity flights on the KC-135. The space shuttle is a notoriously dirty environment by any laboratory standards. That's why they always close up any shuttle service and buy the shuttle well before it gets too near. This is especially true for satellites such as the Hubble Space Telescope with high precision optics. Again, I do apologize for not responding sooner. Signed, Joe Newt. The point of philosophy is to start with something so simple as not to seem worth stating, and to end with something so paradoxical that no one will believe it. Bertrand Russell. The alternative space program theory hypothesizes that while NASA is launching the space shuttle and the Apollo missions to the moon, there is this secret, hidden space program that is going on behind closed doors. Deep inside of secret uh, Air Force bases and research labs, black op projects are developing very, very high technology and high space technology vehicles that no one knows about, that only a few people know who are sequestered in these secret labs. Everyone has heard of Area 51 in Nevada at this point in time, and at Area 51, many people have gone out with video cameras and videotaped incredible objects glowing very brightly, shooting through the sky at amazing speeds, and even making angular turns, similar to some of the stuff we've seen on the NASA transmissions. So we asked the question, are some of these mysterious objects that are appearing on the NASA videos the alternative space program vehicles being witnessed by the cameras of the space shuttle themselves? NASA peering into the alternative space program knowing very, very well of its, of its existence and actually studying the, the maneuverability and some of the capabilities of these aircraft. There are four major defense contractors in the United States. You have Boeing, you have Lockheed Martin, you have SAIC, and you have EG&G. EG&G, one of the largest of the four, in 1968 at the nuclear test site rocket station successfully tested Phobos 2A, the most powerful nuclear propulsion uh, drive ever developed, was successful in 1968. Today, in the year 2001, we have to assume that nuclear propulsion systems are very, very advanced. But there's another problem. So far to date, most nuclear uh, reaction systems that have been developed are very, very radioactive. Earlier I was talking about deuterium helium-3 fusion developed by Bogdan Castle Maglitch from MIT and how that project produced a non-radioactive 18 million electron volt charge and how that could be applied to not only powering space stations but also um, driving the ion generators and ion propulsion systems for very, very spa fast space um, travel. But that system didn't get developed. So looking at how radioactive nuclear power sources are, we would expect, if one of these vehicles were flying around our skies, that the astronauts would have to wear tremendous shielding in the form of a spacesuit to protect them from severe levels of radiation. But yet, if anyone had ever actually encountered one of these craft on their own, they would be exposed to high levels of radiation. So we, we, we would need evidence, evidence of that fact. There are many evidence and many cases like that. Betty and Barney Hill, both people who were um, witnesses to a UFO um, event. They actually saw UFOs, they claim, and they actually have documented severe radiation burns on their body. Betty Cash, in 1980 in Texas, saw a UFO and pursued it, came into close proximity of this UFO. She received severe, severe radiation burns for which she was hospitalized. Um, back in, in uh, 1998, she died. No one knows for certain whether she died of, of the severe radiation burns that she received, but we do know that she received severe radiation burns. Now, if we're going to make a distinction between an extraterrestrial civilization spacecraft 
and an actual alternative space program space vehicle, this is where we would make our distinction. We can't assume that someone traveling from Alpha Centauri or Ceres coming here and traveling for 8.7 years would expose their bodies to high levels of radiation. They, they would die long before they even got here. So what the signature of, of one of these radioactive vehicles would be, would be exactly like what happened to, to Betty Cash. And I think there are many other documented cases out there where people have encountered UFOs and received radiation burns. So it might be a signature, it might be an answer pointing to the possibility that, that we have developed very, very advanced spacecraft and we do have what may be UFOs in our own uh, space programs, but somehow it hasn't really leaked out to the public. The power of accurate observation is commonly called cynicism by those who have not got it. George Bernard Shaw. So at this point in my investigation, I was beginning to not trust NASA. I was not really happy with the answers to the questions I sent them. And I detected they knew a lot more that they weren't telling me. So I decided to use the Freedom of Information Act request against Dr. Joseph Newt III and request that all files on this subject be delivered to me so that I could look deeper into it. The letter he wrote me back on February 24, 1999. Dear Mr. Sarita, enclosed with this letter is my entire file on the matter in question, including the videotape that you so kindly sent to me for my comment. I did not send copies of my email replies to your previous email messages, as I infer from the content of this present letter that you retain your own copies of this correspondence. Since I'm not at all interested in the speculations of Dr. Lou Frank, and since my own research interests do not involve the data sets upon which these speculations are based, I have no other information on these matters other than that enclosed, all of which was sent by you. Signed, Dr. Joseph A. Newt III, Head, Astrochemistry Branch. P.S. Thanks for the great stamps. I had not seen anything like them previously. So at this point, Dr. Newth is saying that there is no other file at NASA, that my investigation that I'm conducting is the only file and the only investigation being done into this phenomena at NASA. I didn't know whether to believe it, but I didn't want to pursue him any further on that particular question, and I wanted to move on with our dialogue and see how much deeper I could go into this investigation. Later, I would have to try to contact Dr. Louis A. Frank myself and try to get a dialogue going with him. On February 25th, 1996, on Space Shuttle Mission Number STS-75, NASA launched a possible breakthrough energy technology experiment. They launched a 12-mile long electrical conductor cable called an electrodynamic tether designed to collect high-energy electrons in the Earth's ionosphere and magnetic fields. The motion of the conductor tether across the Earth's magnetic fields induces a voltage along the 12-mile length of the tether. Utilizing estimates and the charge densities of the Earth's magnetic fields and the ionosphere, the voltage produced is expected to be up to several hundred volts per kilometer. If successful, the experiment could produce a lot of electrical power. If additional power is driven along the tether in the opposite direction to that which it normally wants to flow, the tether, in theory, could push creating propulsion against the Earth's gravity to raise the shuttle's orbit. The advantage to this revolutionary technology in propulsion is that it does not require any rocket fuel. If successful, electrodynamic tethers could prove a way to greatly reduce the cost of in-space propulsion. For example, the International Space Station could keep itself in orbit, saving nearly $2 billion in orbital reboost rocket fuel for every 10 years of the station's operations. But on February 25th, after the 12-mile tether began producing electricity, an unexpected overload of electrical energy fluctuating between 2 and 10 times that predicted due to inaccurate estimates in the electrical charge of the Earth's magnetic fields, ionosphere, and possibly space radiation, fried the tether conductor cable and it broke, severing it from the space shuttle. So the tether has broken at the, uh, at the boom. The tether has broken and it's going away from us. Get it on the, get it on the TV, Claude. Please get it on the TV. The tether has broken. Copy. Uh, 
Columbia and the satellite now 77 nautical miles apart. Again, that call reporting that uh, the crew can see the tether and uh, see the satellite, to, that it's beautiful. This view uh, showing uh, the satellite. Again, uh, just moving into sunrise. 81 nautical miles now from Columbia. Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us, and uh, it's uh, illuminated by the sun at such low angles. So this is just a lot of stray light and it's getting washed out uh, quickly, but uh, Quad is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Copy that. You know that description by the crew, this is uh, the tether in the satellite, uh, the satellite with 12, approximately 12 miles of tether still attached to it. Columbia and the satellite are now just passing over the west coast of uh, northern Africa. The two spacecraft are now 90 nautical miles apart. Controllers for the satellite uh, did have communications uh, with it uh, during the close pass uh, between Columbia and the satellite. Columbia Houston, that's a much better view, uh, a lot more contrast visible. And how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we see, it seems to resemble a, a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? Satellite uh, now 100 nautical miles. Charlie, completely unzoomed, and uh, you see the full extent of the tether. I try to adjust the focus, but I can't get better than that. Okay, Claude, thank you. I'm going to zoom in now. In the summer of 1999, I met with Martin Stubbs, the program manager of the cable TV station, who had recorded over 400 hours of NASA's live broadcasts. He gave me some videotape on a new incident that happened in February of 1996 on space shuttle mission STS-75, um, what was called the tether incident. So what you just saw on the videotape showed a 12-mile long satellite, a satellite attached to a 12-mile long tether, which is like a conductor cable. It's a very, very thin, uh, one-tenth of a, of a centimeter in, in, th in thickness cable that was used to conduct electricity in the Earth's ionosphere. 
As we saw earlier, space is supercharged with high energy particles and NASA was trying to take advantage of these particles to see if they could build up a charge on the tether and actually see a gain or produce some electricity. They charged the tether with some, with some electricity, but then an overload of highly charged product particles flooded the tether and produced so much electricity it snapped. On February 25th at about 7.30 p.m., the tether broke away from the shuttle Columbia and drifted about 77 miles away. So the scene you, that you just saw actually starts at about 77 miles away. The camera pans down. We see a long line, which is 12 miles long of tether, a small satellite attached to the end, and then a swarm of little objects, little balls of light, just moving in from all different directions and different velocities and different speeds. Then the cameras actually zoom in and we actually get to take a close look at what we're seeing here. It's astounding. We see up here in the right hand corner, we see a very large disk clearly going behind the tether. And we can, look, we can actually see little, little black dots racing around to suggest some sort of a magnetic field effect. And coming through the middle, we see another very large disk moving clearly behind the tether. The light from the tether shines in front of of the background object, which is the UFO. Um, if we use this piece of wood as an example, we can see what a disk looks like when it's passing behind a foreground object. It's really very quite simple. So if the, if the disk was passing in front of the tether, it would look something like this, and it doesn't look like that. When we look in the middle and we see this large disk passing through the middle, we can see again it's passing, it's passing behind the tether. If this was the tether and this was the UFO, we could clearly see it's going behind. And if it was going in front, it would look something like this. It doesn't look like that. So because we know the shuttle is at least 77 miles away and drifting further away from the object, from the tether, and we know the objects are going behind the tether, we can therefore use the 12 mile length of the tether as a relative measuring rod for um, actually making measurements of the minimum diameters of some of these disks. And According to my calculations, against the 12 mile length of the tether, this disk passing through the top section here measures a minimum of two to three miles in diameter. That's assuming it's right up next to the back of the tether. If it's actually farther behind the tether than I think, then the disk could be much, much larger. The further it gets behind it relative to the distance of the tether, the larger it actually is in reality in compared to measuring it against the tether. Again here, this disk going through the middle here, um, I, I estimate it to be between two and three miles in diameter. If a UFO were flying over the city of Los Angeles in the downtown core or New York, and it was two to three miles wide in diameter, it would black out the entire sky. It would be an Independence Day sized craft that would, that would literally um, cause massive panic and massive alarm. But again, when you consider that the cameras on the space shuttle here are, are seeing into the near ultraviolet spectrum of light, as we, as we learned earlier, it's a spectrum of light that's too high in energy for us to see with our eyes. But because the camera can see into it, it, it can basically be capable of capturing an image that is so high in energy that although we can't see it with our eyes, it, it actually still is there. We just can't actually see it. Earlier I suggested how if a UFO were capable of doing light speed travel, a solid object initially, and it could change its frequency into high frequency energy, the UFO would still, or spaceship would still have actual structure to it, it would actually still have mass, but in its high frequency state it would turn into pure energy. Therefore as it would appear on a camera, it would be very translucent, it would look like energy even though it has structure, and that's exactly what these objects look like. They look like almost transparent, translucent uh, disks, which actually as they pass behind some background stars, you can actually see starlight shining through them to suggest that they're in a pure wave or energy, energy form. So, and again, this one, we can see the actual magnetic field rotating very, very quickly around the craft, suggesting that what we're looking at is pure energy, mass vibrating at a very high frequency. Across the top of the screen, we can see a very powerful pulsing coming off of one of the UFOs as it moves across the screen. Later I would look very closely at the wave patterns on the UFO and study the wave patterns and find some incredible, incredible conclusions, incredible quantum, quantum physics and quantum energy equations. But we'll look at that much later. For now we're left with the most astounding event ever captured on film. 
the largest UFOs ever captured on film, two to three miles in diameter, and, and quite conclusive. They're definitely going behind the tether. They can't be uh, produced by some sort of an optical illusion. If this is the tether way in the background and the camera to the space shuttle is way up here, you know, you can get a really bad um, reading against using the tether, the 12 mile length of the tether, as any sort of relative measuring rod. But I'm not doing that. We are confirming, and it's very obvious when you look at the tape, that the UFOs are going behind the tether. On February 28, 1996, United Press International published an article, Satellite Signals a Puzzle, mystifying the STS-75 tether incident. When the astronauts were actually able to regain contact with the tethered satellite, they found several unexplainable surprises. The article states, There has been an event on the satellite that we do not understand yet, astronaut David Wolf told the Columbia crew. First, radio signals from the satellite caused engineers some surprise. The configuration of several systems had changed from when NASA lost contact with the craft on Sunday. For example, the spacecraft's nitrogen fuel tank was emptied and its steering thruster valves were opened. In addition, a gyroscope that had been left on was powered off, while two other gyroscopes remained on. All of these incidents require electronic remote control commands from the astronauts on the shuttle. But if the astronauts did not make these commands, then who or what did? Could it have been the unidentified flying object that took over the controls of the satellite? So take a look at the tape again and see for yourself if some of the things I'm saying are not true. Dear Mr. Sarita, if the phenomena is interesting enough to deserve an investigation, then our preference would be for controlled experiments that closely duplicate the circumstances of the original observations and test our working hypotheses until they are either verified or falsified. A second line of investigation would be to obtain more evidence of the original sightings. For example, additional shuttle camera tapes. There are at least four mounted in the bay to see if the same objects were seen on these. If these objects were large, then the same object would appear on two or more cameras, and these can be used to triangulate the distance from the shuttle to the object. If there are no objects that appear simultaneously on two or more cameras, then one must conclude that the objects seen in the near fields of the individual cameras and the dust bunny hypotheses get stronger. I would ask that you apply this line of reasoning and the test proposed in my last email and above to the evidence in hand to see which more consistently explains the observations. Signed, Dr. Joseph Newt. Dear Mr. Sarita, I received your package, but other duties have kept me from watching the tape you sent. I must admit that I am somewhat reluctant to begin another dialogue with you on this subject, as our last discussion nearly resulted in a formal Freedom of Information Act request on an area in which I have no formal responsibility or specialized NASA knowledge. I do not mind responding to inquiries from the public since I feel that this is part of my job as a government employee. However, I really have little interest in getting into battles when my honest attempts to answer your questions do not seem to agree with what you want me to say. My personal home VCR has been broken for a while and I have not yet had time to borrow one. When I do, I will let you know what I think that I see in the tape. Signed, Dr. Joseph Newt III. You're about to see what is called the star sequence. It's a very simple scene. The space shuttle's cameras are looking down at the Earth. Um, the space shuttle is about 300 miles above the Earth, and we're looking down. We see a couple of fuzzy lights that are kind of curve-shaped. And then we see a light going by, floating right by them. And then we see another one. And then we actually hear the astronauts talking and saying, I see a light going by in the ground down there. And there's a long pause. And then we hear, it could have been a star, Bill. And after that, we see a few more of these things going by. So we know between the space shuttle and the Earth, there's no stars. There, the sun is the nearest star in the solar system. So we know that this isn't actually a star going by on the ground because we're looking, we're looking right down at the Earth. There's no space between the space shuttle on the Earth where a star could possibly appear. So obviously the word star is code for something. 
but code for what? Is it code for the word UFO? Before you do that, Mario, uh, could you tell in this uh, if the red Stimsonite is on the left? I believe it was based upon what I saw in the day imagery, uh, because it was it it, it 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 remained very stable. On STS-80, if you look here, what you're about to see, this is the, this is the Earth down here. You'll, the, one of the first things you'll see on the screen is a little pulsing object. It's actually quite big. It's, a, it's around that big. Moving over here, and then you'll see it change, actually change directions and go out into space. But that's not what we're looking for. In the middle of the screen, slowly, you'll see a very big kind of translucent ball with a hole in the middle, very similar to the rest of our UFOs kind of streaking by and going into the distance. And slowly, slowly, slowly as it goes into the distance, you can see it getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we were experiencing the depth of field of one of these large disks as it's moving past, this, way, way past the space shuttle and into the far distance. It basically reaches a point, and once it reaches this point of its destination, it stops moving, and then it becomes extra luminous. It starts to give off some extra light. And slowly what we start to see is a formation an actual circular formation, kind of looking at an angle in, into this formation. We can see these objects that are slowly moving into position and then actually lighting up. Once they hit their positions, they're lighting up. This is suggesting incredible intelligence, something you wouldn't expect for space debris or space junk or some sort of natural phenomena. You certainly, certainly couldn't expect that meteorites or shooting stars could could fly through space and then stop at a point and then all of a sudden give off this extra luminosity. The luminosity is constant once they start giving it off. As the camera starts to slowly go away and it's moving over the curvature of the Earth, we see more and more of these things coming into position and then once they reach their positions, they light off. And then, finally, we see another object kind of like this one coming in from the foreground and heading towards the center of the circle. 
it becomes very, very faint. You can barely see it on the screen as it's moving into position. And finally, when it gets into what appears to be the center of the circle, it literally just starts shining like a diamond. And its light is luminous and continuous. This whole formation suggests amazing intelligence and amazing organization. Could this be something staged by NASA? Or could these actually be UFOs? We see two of our very familiar looking disc shaped objects coming into position here and here on your video monitor. One comes in from one direction and one comes in from another direction. And then we hear a gopher wake shield. That's something that one of the people from Huntsville, Alabama say on the radio. And then they just literally, it's after we hear go for wake show, they just literally bolt out into space and disappear in a matter of a second or two. Houston, for wake show. So I researched what wake shield was because I thought maybe this had something to do with, a, again, a black ops test or some sort of a, of a test that NASA was doing out there. Wake shield has nothing to do with these two things. Wake shield is actually a satellite used for growing pure crystals in the wake of the satellite. When the satellite actually travels through space and it's moving, it actually produces a wake just like a boat does on a lake. And inside the wake, they grow very high quality crystals for you know computer chips and semiconductors. So wake shield has literally nothing to do with the two objects you're seeing. The objects are probably unidentified flying objects or, or UFOs.